Catelyn Stark, a.k.a. the Karen in the North. I mean, I know there are a lot of dumb characters in Game of Thrones, but she might be the worst and most annoying character to watch and or read as she fumbles around in Westeros within the, the War of the Five Kings. She is, well, maybe she's not the worst. She is close to the worst. If you're talking Battle of Five Kings or the War of the Five Kings, yeah, she probably actually is the worst. Did I say battle? No, I think I screwed up. You did perfect. <laughs> Uh, before we get into this, so go to our community tab and look at our giant, massive, throbbing poll. Vote on it. It determines what video we're going to do next, usually. So, yeah, give it a look. We were teasing this Karen in the North one since I think the Rob Simp video we did. We touched a little bit on it last week's video for Walder Frey in defense of our boy, the great Walder Frey. The so, great. Well, we want to do a whole episode dedicated to everyone's favorite Karen in the North and... Uh, stick around to the end of this video because I think I have a theory. I just thought of right before we start recording. I'm like, I think, I'm not sure if someone talked about this. Because I feel like it's been stated out there, but I just want to make sure. Catch at the end of this video. Uh, that we. I haven't heard it yet, it. too, we, so it's, we'll it's, see. We, we, we talked about the, the concept that he had a theory. We, I don't know what this theory is. <laughs> yeah. It's it blow my mind. All right, well, my biggest gripe with Catelyn Stark is that her bad judgment calls put other people, mostly her allies, in bad situations and uh, basically acts as kind of like an antagonist to who we view our protagonists throughout the series. Yeah, dude, I totally agree with that. There's a couple moments throughout the, not even just the War of the Five Kings, but if, even if you go earlier than that, there's, a, I mean, I'm sure they're the exact same ones as you, but it's Ned. Obviously, we're not a huge fan of Ned on this channel in all ways because we think he's an idiot. He's way too yeah. honorable for his own good, and he just makes the dumbest decisions. And this goes for Catelyn, though, too. The whole nature of their situation, while Ned is in King's Landing with Arya and Sansa, and Catelyn is up north with Rob and the boys, her both of their decision-making is beyond questionable. Like They know that the pretense by which they're up there is that John Aaron was murdered by the Lannisters. And they believe it, by the way. It's not like they hear this thing and they brush it off. Ah, what are the chances of that shit? No way, no way. The Lannisters are good people. Catelyn believes it almost immediately because it comes from her crazy-ass sister. <laughs> well, well, she doesn't crazy know. Crazy-ass sister. She, well, what? yeah, but she doesn't know she's crazy at the time. But, yes, it's her belief in her crazy-ass sister is what leads uh, Ned to go down the decision. Again, Cat Catelyn like, basically backs up Lysa, Littlefinger, uh, in these situations and gives Ned kind of like bad information so that when he ever makes his decision, which is not going to be the best decision inherently, but it's worse now off because of because of Catelyn's doing it. And I, I'm going to go into it a little bit later on here about each you know situation she's she's brought up. But I do feel bad for Ned because he's he's a fish out of water, right? He's a high school football coach being brought into a Fortune 500 company to be the CEO. It's like, no, yeah, right. he's better off being the high school football coach who can inspire these, you know, it's just a totally different leadership dynamic. So when he's brought into King's Landing, yes, he's a fish out of water, but then his wife like tells him to trust certain people and uh, his wife then captures Tyrion, which just makes it just I know. harder for That's Ned. That's what it is. Like, it's like, hey, it, Ned, do, do, do everything I say. It's going to work out great for you. By the way, the, you're in the belly of the beast surrounded by all the evil little bacteria at the stomach of King's Landing that are the Lannisters and the Lannister supporters. I'm going to kidnap one of the most powerful ones <laughs> and basically just let everybody assume that the, my husband was the one who ordered me to do that because I know my husband is so honorable, he's going to defend me to the end and he's going to oh. basically admit to it without me even asking him to do it, which is exactly what happened without even being without even being requested of him. Ned said, no, Jamie, it was me. I ordered the kidnapping of Tyrion, and I understand uh, there were some egos going back and forth there too. Yeah, but uh, no, that is unbelievable. If Catelyn never did that, you know, much of an easier time Ned would have had. He may have lived at least longer. Well, I'm just thinking now. I wonder if the reason why Cat is the way she is is just because Ned is the way he is. Because Catelyn was originally betrothed to Brandon Stark, uh, right. Ned's Chad older brother. I wonder adamantium if, testicle boy. Oh, dude, Brandon might have kept Cat's like attitude in check, but because Ned is the silent wolf, that she's able kind of to dominate him and you know be this kind of you know, pain in the ass, which I, I do believe Benjen left Winterfell as soon as she moved up there because he's like, dude, I can't deal with this. I am not going to deal with this lady. <laughs> She's insane, yeah, dude. We, we, we talked about it before, and that's I think that's completely true. Benjen got out of there while he, the getting was good, you know. Ned can't do that. He is married to her now, and as we know, you know, Ned and Catelyn, they didn't meet each other before the wedding day. It was a totally arranged marriage, and from Ned's point of view, I understand it's like, well, 
you know, I know my brother Brandon wasn't officially married to her either, but it was kind of decided for quite a while that they were going to get married. Right. And it's know. not like, and it's not like he left her, like cut it off. He was still planning on going through with it. And I respect my Giga Chad elder, you know, my older brother who can beat the shit out of me and tell me what's what. And I learn everything I know from him. Uh-huh. Uh, of course, I'll marry the woman that he was going to marry. That was good enough for him. Didn't Which work did- out so well, though, did it? Yeah, which makes me more upset about Catelyn when you think about this, too, because if Catelyn gets mad at Ned for, which I mean, I, I don't know how much of this plays a part. I think it plays a little bit, but there's another part, I think, uh, later on that plays a bigger part into Catelyn's hatred of John. But for her to get mad at Ned for, you know, having sex with some woman uh, out of wedlock while he's at war, it's like Ned did not betroth himself or want to get married to you, Cat. You know, he, he, he wanted somebody else clearly so she should understand that a little bit that why john's born but i think it's mostly the fact that ned brings john to court with him you know back to winterfell that's why she hates it even more but yeah, it, that at that it. point that should be on a ned thing not a not a a john thing right like i don't know cat's logic and all that is just messed up well it's not only that though it's that i understand the initial anger about it but how could you possibly hold a grudge for this long like this is something that only an intentionally bitchy person would do. <laughs> you have to go out of your way. Yeah. You have to try to still be angry about it. You'd have to catch yourself over time, be like, "Oh, like there's John hanging out with Rob, my two boys." Like, wait, wait, no, shit, stupid, stupid, stupid. I hate John. We hate John. <laughs> it's like she's like, you'd have to. She's like Gollum. We, we hate, hate him. him. Yeah, him. Yeah, and then she pokes around at you know John's maybe mother when he starts when she starts asking Ned about a Chardain. and Ned the only time Ned has a backbone to her is like hey don't you ever say that name don't you ever fucking say that name shut the fuck up <laughs> like stop and she's like okay I guess we'll hit a nerve it's the only time she respected him I know exactly and and there's like a weird uh, it's a chapter a little scene in the book where they're having sex in book one and meanwhile they're having sex. Callan's just thinking of like River Run and just like living down there and just like the pleasantries of that. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, we're done having sex. It's like, Ooh. but she's like, yeah, I'm happy. I'm hoping he, in you know, uh, planted a seed in me. But like, is Jesus that how Catelyn gets off? Is that she just daydreams? Anyways, I don't know how much of this. It, it makes me think. Is. Makes me think poorly of Ned. No, there's no way. Listen, if it's clapping hard enough, man, it doesn't matter if you're <laughs> you in love or not. She's not. <laughs> she's gonna be distracted at least from her own thoughts. Like Ned, dude, what's going on? That scene alone tells me that Ned's like an in and out guy, but like never fully in or never fully out. Like maybe one inch back and forth. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. It, it's like the the what what's the um the situation like uh you know your brother's in you and you're in your dad and like which way do you go to get out or oh what, yeah what's, yeah like do you, back, your do you go forward or back out yeah do you go forward or back out like that's the level of movement that he's willing to move in a heterosexual like traditional feudal sexual relationship so. I don't know. I'm not thinking highly of Ned here, but this is about Callan, not Ned. Uh, last thing I'll say, though, is she complains always that she doesn't feel a northerner, you know, felt welcomed up there, even though she has, like, how many northern kids? She's born Stark children. She's been up there for 10 plus years, 16 years. Right? I think Rob's 16 in the books. So she's she should feel very northern-like, yeah. but she's like, I don't feel like I'm still a part of it. It's like, Sh- shut up. That's a you Dude. problem. They built her a sept. They don't even believe in these gods. They, they believe in the old gods. It's like, yeah, dude, welcome to our humble abode, like with our Chadley. Well, okay, listen, on this channel, we do believe that the religion seven. of the seven is more yeah. Chadley, of course. <laughs> like the Andals rule, you know. But uh, but in Winterfell, you know, being like culturally relative here, they have the old gods. Why should they feel obligated to build a sept of the newer gods? Why should they feel obligated? They had to do it just to appease the super bitch, the Karen of the North. Right. And, and she it, still isn't happy with it. It would seem like simp behavior if we didn't already know the context around Catelyn. And it might just be Ned yeah. just like, okay, fine, I'll build you the sept and you can just stop talking, please. Just go there and pray, please. Knock it off. Just get out of here, please. Right. It's like it's like a Robert Baratheon kind of thing, too. Like if Robert Baratheon did anything to appease Cersei, you'd never call him a simp. He's clearly right. just doing it to like get her out. Yeah, exactly. So, so what do you think about when people compare Catelyn to Tywin in their kind of like aspects to their bastard slash, you know, dwarf children? You know, I know it's not her bastard son, right? But it's a bastard within her family. I think people, you know, look at Tywin as so evil, but Catelyn is like, oh yeah, she's, she's just someone of this culture. It's just okay to hate bastards that are in your family. You know, I, I feel like there might be some hand-waving of Catelyn's actions, but I do think there is... 
don't know. I feel like there's a good faction of love and hate Catelyn, but there's no really like middleman that says like, yeah, I don't know. You know, Catelyn's just Catelyn. It's like, no, it's either you love or hate her. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about the direct comparison between Tywin and Catelyn, I think the comparison is can't really exist because it's like Catelyn occupies. I know it's kind of counter what you just said in a way, but like she kind of occupies a middle ground compared to someone like Tywin. Like Tywin, he doesn't respect Tyrion. He doesn't like that a dwarf is like essentially the heir to Casterly Rock, right? Yeah, like, and is like spitting is, image intellectually. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. I know. I know. So it's like, yeah, he can't get over like these little nitpicky things. But we see a lot of times in uh, Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, where Tywin does defer to Tyrion because he does trust Tyrion on an intellectual level to get shit done. And right, he's not going to he, he's not so stupid that he's going to completely alienate that kid. And yeah, later on, you know, when Tyrion's on death row, like, eh, honestly, we're never going to know the answer to it. Would Tywin have actually let Tyrion die? Probably. But we don't know the answer to that question. Just assuming yes, though, I don't think Catelyn openly wishes for Jon's death. Oh, maybe she does. Now that I'm I think thinking about does. it. I, may, yeah, I think she does. I think so, too. But, but the difference, I, see, this is what I was going to say. I was going to say she occupies this middle ground because, one, she would never trust John intellectually or like put him in any position of power willingly at all, ever. But she also wouldn't let him die or wish him death. But now I actually think that she would wish death upon him. So, no, I think Tywin is actually just completely better because at least he does have some sort of baseline respect for Tyrion. And at least it's based on something, like a little bit, right? Like, if right. you're going to be the lord of a noble house, you probably want that figure to be intimidating in all ways, including visually. And I know that's still shallow, but, I mean, this is like medieval times, dude. You know, it's kind of it's kind of animal. Though. It's kind of animal kingdom versus versus Catelyn, which who has absolutely no basis for hating John whatsoever. Like, you arrived at court a little bit before me and Rob. Boo fucking yeah. who? Yeah, well, the thing with Tywin and Catelyn is Tywin at least makes, like, a bunch of other great moves strategically. Catelyn does not. You know, whenever she's put in a situation like negotiate or, you know, get something done, she generally fails at it. Like the whole Renly Stannis, she does not figure out anything down there to figure out support for the North. Also, the Walder, she sells the farm to Walder Frey to cross a freaking bridge to get down to uh, River Run to break the siege instead of like, you know what, let's just go down to the King's Road and go after Tywin. I don't know if we should really break Seriously. the siege. You know, so Catelyn makes worse moves than Tywin, but... I, I, yeah, Catelyn has the same kind of hatred towards John as Tywin does for Tyrion because when Rob wants to name John his heir after like almost everybody's dead or presumed dead um, within the Stark family, Rob's like, I think I'm gonna name John my heir. And Catelyn's like, Don't you dare! Don't you dare! I don't want to see him up there. It's like, chill out. Who are you? What are you clinging on to, Catelyn? Your husband's yeah. dead. Your your daughters are more likely dead. Your sons you think are dead. Like, what are you clinging on to? Yeah, it makes no sense. It, you're right. It's completely, it's completely, uh, it's unfounded. It's completely unfounded. But I think that's unlike Tywin. Like I said, at least there is a feasible reason why Tywin wouldn't want Tyrion as his heir. And there's the, there was the resentment of that Jamie should have been his heir, and Tywin got totally screwed over by the Mad King, you know, by making, basically taking Jamie out of the running or whatever. Right. So I, I get that he kind of feels out of control of his whole situation, and he does have a lot more on his plate than Catelyn does. It's not even just the war strategy, but it's just in general. The entire legacy of his house is like built on what the decisions that he makes going forward versus Catelyn where it's like, uh, I guess maybe if all of this hatred toward John happened post Ned dying and post Rob dying, maybe it makes a little sense because then she'd be coping because her own bad decisions clearly led to this stuff for right, the most yeah. part. Yep. You know, and so she's just like punishing John as a proxy for herself. But that's not what's happening at all. She hated John from the very beginning. And even watching, like, how John's such a nice guy. How <laughs> do you possibly watch this kid grow up with your own boy, Rob? And it's not like it, this, this dynamic also didn't exist. It didn't exist where Rob was like a little troublemaker and John, like the person who's not really your son, quote unquote, was like outshining him. Everybody liked him more and talked right. badly about Rob. No, like they're both pretty good kids. They just looked a little bit different. So yeah, I, I, there's really no basis for it at all. She's just bad. She's just bad. She's in the wrong. Yeah, and there's there's a line Catelyn says in the books. I think in the TV show she says it as well, where she says, you know, John was sick and she prayed to the gods that uh, I will love this boy as my own if you keep him alive. She had this like like ounce of sympathy in her body to to send a prayer to the Holy Seven. And they answer her prayers, and then she goes, ah, I'm going to go back to hating them anyway. 
It's, it's like one of those classic cartoon things. It's like, I swear, God, if, if you save me right now, I'll dedicate my life to you and follow everything you do. And he does it. And then I'll send, I'm going right back to the life of sin. <laughs> Sorry, no, God. but it's not even it's, that. It's, just it's, that, like, it's like, no, it's like a racist. It's like, it's like a brutal racist. Like, God, I hate all insert race here. You know, I hate every single one of them. God, please make me so I don't absolutely hate them and want to end all of their lives 24 hours a day. You know what I mean? That's what it's like. Right. Is that really sympathy? Or is it just like you, you're you trying to take stress off of yourself? Like You don't care about the other person. That's just trying to relieve some like uncomfortable no, uh, noise. In, in her, what, she's sitting there going like, this baby's so annoying. I can either pray for its death or its health. It's like, well, I guess health because I don't want to pray for its death. I'd feel too bad. But she just only cares or prays about it because the baby's making sound. Maybe that's what it is. It's just inconvenience it's, to her. I think that's what it is, it's inconvenience, because listen, man, there's a lot of things that I'm unhappy with in the world. It would make my life a lot easier if I just didn't care about that stuff and I could just kind of, you know, put a blindfold and earmuffs on and just uh, ignore it. But I can't do that, can I? <laughs> but maybe if, if, dude, if the gods graced me and took it away, that'd be nice. Well, you know who's using a blindfold, what do you want to say, earplugs, you know, doing the Helen Keller simulator within oh. Westeros when it comes to strategy was Catelyn. When she captures... Tyrion, right, on the uh, King's Road, I think it's King's Road, uh, that they're traveling on that tavern. What is she thinking? And and from an outside perspective here, too, right? She's like, I, I might have a, a valuable, you know, Lannister to kidnap right now because there might be, like, an actual war brewing or more assassinations popping off. But from an outside perspective, like, just take, you know, uh, who would be good, like, outside? Like, the high towers, right? Or, or just the Reach in general. They look at this situation, they go, Catelyn? A, a, the Stark Lady captured a Lannister. That's like first strike, you know, because you can't prove that someone sent the assassination of uh, of your son with the cat's paw dagger. And plus, like when Tyrion says it too, you think someone would send an assassin with his own blade? Like, are they thinking for like two seconds here? So from an outside perspective, it just looks like they attack first, the Starks. So it, it actually lines up more with what was that play in Essos that. Uh, that Arya goes to, and she witnesses it, and it yeah, makes yeah, it like yeah. Ned is trying to overthrow, and he's actually supposed to be like a coup, uh, trying to run a coup. Doesn't it make it? That gives that narrative more credence as it goes further on. Oh the yeah, series. it makes well, it makes From a lot more sense. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, she she shot the first shot or whatever. Like right, yes. she assassinated Franz Ferdinand. Right, like that's that's how it that's how it comes off. And dude, it's like you said, the logic. Like Tyrion says, like what kind of a retard would arm an assassin with his own signature <laughs> weapon? Right, Cat like this thing has, I would this, do that. <laughs> Yes, yeah, this has like my name engraved on it. <laughs> and it, it, why would anybody ever? And it's like in that moment, what do you think's going through her mind? Is it is she like, my God, I'm an idiot? Like, shit, he's completely right, but I have to stick to it now because sure, how many yeah. people are now looking at me? They all heard him say that to me. It's like, do I back down and now I'm completely useless and untrustworthy for the rest of this campaign? Did I just screw everything up? Or does she think like this is somehow like a a big 4D chess move from Tyrion. It's like, I'm going to arm him with my own blade. Then I'm going to bring up how stupid it would be if I armed him with my own blade just to throw her off the trail. Really, it was me the whole time. It's like, I I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that's possibly the dumbest decision of all because you could argue that the kidnapping of Tyrion really is what lit the match that started this whole conflict. Like, maybe it would have petered out without this moment. Right, yeah. It definitely put more... Uh, because I think whoever sent, well, there's a theory that whoever sent the assassin, it could be Littlefinger, or I, I kind of believe this more that uh, Joffrey maybe sent the assassin, uh, because I think Joffrey's the one that says he knows what Valyrian steel looks like. He actually has that dagger, I think, from his you know his presumed dad. It's his you know Robert, but I, I don't think it's Littlefinger who sent the assassin. I don't think we fully know yet. Let let it's us know down in the comments. It's never confirmed. Yeah, comment down below who you think who actually sent that assassin. But regardless. Catelyn, when she does this to Tyrion, she actually makes Tyrion more powerful. She teams uh, Tyrion up with Bronn in this, as well as takes him up to the, you know, Eyrie, where he meets the Hill clans, and then he has his own posse by the end of this. So Tyrion really kind of rolls out of the Eyrie, you know, better than when he, you know, left Winterfell the second time, right? So he, he is actually more powerful and more of a formidable opponent to anyone in court so thank you Catelyn for that dude yeah Tyrion's got an entourage afterward it's great that that, that actually I mean it, it wins him like favor but also not with Tywin as well because it's like it added to their numbers even if they're not like super skilled fighters and even though Tywin was like outwardly very annoyed by this situation right the hill tribes did fight for Tyrion you know I don't <laughs> 
also with all of their deaths, Tyrion kind of got out of paying his debts a lot in that way too. So I don't know. A lot of a lot of stuff worked out well for Tyrion because of Catelyn. So maybe maybe, maybe Catelyn's team Lannister secretly the whole time. I don't know. Yeah, Something yeah. To, there's there's good evidence for considering she also let Jaime go. Like yes. Possibly. I don't even know if this is stupider than the Tyrion thing or less stupid. Those these are like the top two stupid things I think. Oh, I, have, I, I, do, I do think they are. The Jamie letting Jamie away has to be a worse move than Tyrion. At least Tyrion, even though this is like a, such a huge overreaction to the Tyrion coming down, because you actually believe again, like all the evidence lines up with him, and you believe Littlefinger, which I think we're going to talk about here in a little bit about her interactions with Littlefinger. But Jamie letting him off, he's such a huge asset to the war, and you have girls. Your your two daughters are at court. They at least you believe they are in King's Landing, and you're just gonna let him go, in hopes that he will release them and bring them back. It's like it's not even like you're doing a, host, a hostage negotiation where you're gonna meet him halfway. Let's meet at Heron Hall. Let's swap hostages, and then let's let's go right and leave. No, she just like lets him go, which is such a it's one of the dumbest moves in all of uh, in all of Game of Thrones. And to think that you know she's doing this out of an act of desperation to like preserve her family, but might have been the death nail within our own son and our own life. Well, there's there's no thought process, too. Like, let's just assume that the, the trade actually worked. Let's assume that the Lannisters were, for some reason, picking this one time to tell the truth, and Sansa and Arya were both in King's Landing, and they're willing to trade them for Jamie. right? Let's just pretend yeah. that was what the situation yep. was going to be. They make the trade, and now they're at a complete military disadvantage, potentially, yeah, or at least maybe not complete military disadvantage. It might be an exaggeration because Rob's still doing well at this point. But they're no better off militarily. Meanwhile, the Lannisters got this massive morale boost of getting the Kingslayer back, dude. Right. Like that. It, it seriously, it's a huge, it's a huge, huge plus. Not to mention his just his strategizing too. It's not just the morale boost, but it's the actual value he brings to the table in a war. And all you got what was back two worthless daughters, but really only one because she just didn't know that Sansa was the only one remaining. I, it's really it's a lose lose situation for her. It's very selfish. It's like a very emotional response out of nowhere. It's like I lost. Was this before or after Bran and Rickon got I th- I like quote unquote killed? I think it was. Wasn't it after? Isn't that kind of why she did this? Because her kids th- like dying all around was, her or whatever. I thought it was after because yeah because they the Winterfell was taken. I think they think the the boys are killed. I believe. Right, and I think I think that's part of what drug uh, motivated yeah. no, her yeah, to that, say like, okay, right. like I two of my kids are just straight up dead. Uh, I need to at least salvage what I have left. Like Rob's in a war; he might die as well. And well, if I can help it, he's going to die at the hands of the phrase. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Real quick, to be fair, Catelyn did make one good decision, one good call in this entire thing, and that was advising Rob against Theon going to yes. the scum of Westeros, Balon swamp ass's house to ask for. <laughs> You know, help oh. in the north. Why would you ever trust this guy? It's it's disgusting. No, that is her her best uh, call. And I really wish Rob would have just did a, like a Freaky Friday situation and had uh, you know Theon and Catelyn switch bodies and then go negotiate with their uh, respective individuals. Catelyn with Walder Frey and Theon with Balon. And would love to see the different strategies there, right? Because then Theon talking to uh, Walder Frey would have been like, Just sh- shut the fuck up and open your doors. I will grape every one of your daughters unless you open it up. And he's like, what in the world? Like, <laughs> you're going to do what? <laughs> I'll open the gates. I got to see this. <laughs> oh, but like the whole thing with Catelyn and Littlefinger and their relationship that, that started before the series began plays huge throughout all of this, uh, you know, the books and the series. Her friend zoning Littlefinger might be the most consequential, what do you want to say? Yeah, friend zoning of all time. If if she didn't do that, or if she like never let him on, or you know, played with his emotions, because I do believe she played with his emotions a little bit. I don't think it was just this like, oh, oh, Peter, I think you're just so cute. It's like, no, you definitely know what you're doing, lady. You did not just. Oh, like, dude, are you kidding me? Practicing kissing. Oh, practicing dude. kissing Are you, and then also yeah oh, I'll, I'll practice with you let's kiss for a half hour and then peter tries to rightfully slip her the tongue like they got to progress this a little bit and what does she do she blue balls him are you serious the ultimate blue baller unlike liza who's a total freak like you know it grips liza's disgusting i'm not saying little finger had to you know end up with her or whatever but i don't understand why she's so rude about it later on when they're in their i don't know if it's they're in their teens or what but Peter tries to, you know, actually make a legit advance. Like, he works up the nerve to try to kiss Callan. I think he tries to kiss her anyway. 
and she just laughs at him. I know. Oh, like, she laughs. Are you kidding me? Like, how about a cordial little letdown? Like, oh, Peter, like, I'm so sorry. I know we had this stuff when we were kids, but you have to understand, like, I'm going to be betrothed to a higher lord. Like, I, I, I love you like a brother. Right. I know. Laughs at him? Oh, you just created a serial killer. You know that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is the moment. See, I, we can't go too hard on Catelyn in this, down this road for too much longer. Because this is the point where Peter became a simp. A pathetic, oh, yes. groveling yep. simp. Still try, dude, challenges Brandon Stark to a fight. Normally that would be kind of a noble thing, but this is just pathetic, dude. Like, what was you he hoping gonna, to happen? I know, you're going to lose. There's no way. There's no way you can beat him. And and here, so here's my theory too, because you know Brandon then you know cuts Peter so deep all the way up to his neck that he yeah. has to wear like turtlenecks basically the whole time he's on screen or you know he's in the show. But I, I believe Brandon actually got to know Cat a little bit more and wasn't a big fan. So then when he was at King's Landing and it was like his, he's trying to save his dad, you know, from like I think it was him, right? Who who's Brandon had the chain around his neck, right? And his dad was burning alive, and he had to go save him, right? I think it was that yeah, way. Yeah, right? yeah, he, he's, yeah. He's trying to reach for his dad as his dad is burning. I, They're just out of reach, yeah. I, I think Brandon made a calculated decision there. He goes, you know what? I think I'm just going to kill myself. He's like, Brandon, you can reach it. Just lean over to the right. He's like, nope, I can't. I'm just going to choke myself because I don't want to go back to cat. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can see that being true. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's, I have another theory too, but that now that I'm thinking about it, I'm just like, Cat is so insufferable, and if he knew as much as he should know about Cat, um, but then again, maybe I, you know I said earlier that Brandon might be the person to be able to like put the guardrails on Cat's behavior. But seeing how she treated uh, Peter, that might not be the case. She might already be like a, you know, uh, what do you want to say? I don't know how else to describe her. She's not a homewrecker. She's not a hellion. She's just like an evil woman, I guess. She is. She the gets off hearts. on. She gets off on blue ball, and she gets off. She's like a super prude, except with probably Brandon. She's probably a freak with Brandon. We know that she's bored as hell with Ned, so she's got to be used to some freaky stuff. Did she keep her maidenhead for Ned? Was that ever established? I believe she did, but I I don't think she broke it with Brandon. Uh, I don't no, think not with Brandon, anything. but I'm I'm guessing she oh, got before? some practice with the local chads. Yeah, down in River Run. Like I don't see any not other little way. Finger? Nah, well, maybe Littlefinger. It's like maybe it's like it's like you can't slip with the tongue. So maybe maybe she let him smash, but no kissing. And then also he wasn't allowed to finish. He's like, <laughs> okay, Catelyn, I love you. I won't. I promise. This reminds me of somebody we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, listen, man. If that is the case, that Brandon realized in his last moments, or you know, he got to know her a little bit better. It does suck that he couldn't, you know, put his bro first in that last moment be like yeah I know my dad's dying I know I do inevitably want to end my own life because I don't want to live with Catelyn and I will do so but I got to at least understand the chain of events that's probably going to follow Catelyn's probably going to be betrothed to my boy Ned my younger brother or Benjen God help his soul and I should warn them first I should warn them first to either find new women ASAP like you know Ned go with your go with your heart marry Ashara Dane or end your own lives before you're subject to this stuff. I think I think you should have given him a warning, but I like that theory. I think that's good. Yeah, my, my other theory, which this is the one that I was teasing at the beginning, so if you've gotten this far, here's my um, my guess, and I think people have talked about this, that, you know, Beric Dondarrion gave his, like, last kiss to Catelyn so she could become Lady Stoneheart, right? Which is, right. like, the perfect embodiment of Catelyn. You know, just bitch supreme, um, annoying, just being a nuisance within the Riverlands, not being really a force for good at all for uh, our protagonist. So just yeah, basically yeah. carry on from her previous life. I, I do I do want to expound <laughs> on that a little bit after you're done with your theory, but go ahead. Okay, uh, and then I think because Barrett gave the last kiss to Catelyn, Catelyn's going to have to give the last kiss to John to bring him back. I, I don't know how you get her up <laughs> to the north, but it'd just be so funny. I, I don't know. I really re- wish it was like a revenge fuck. You know, for them, but I mean, that might be too. They're far. gonna fuck. They're going all the way. I wish I would do. Did he finish you, or no? Is yeah, it like I'll, Peter? Uh, <laughs> send any like he uh, wants to so bad. S- send any Rule Thirty Four art of of uh, John Snow being brought back to life by you know Lady Stoneheart to sixteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue. That's where we'll be receiving all of our fan. Yeah, art. that's our that's our PO box. <laughs> so send it all there, please. I like that theory. I think it's a good theory. I'd like to have if that happens. That's kind of full circle. That's like character development for her for the first time, right? Like right. she has to go with what she hates and like she understands that 
fucking John, the person that she hates the most, is for the good of the greater realm. Uh, yes. And, you know, they're not blood related, so there's like no taboo there. Maybe she'll finally enjoy it. Maybe she won't be thinking about River Run for once. Maybe it's the hate that'll fuel her enjoyment for sex. Maybe it's a sexual awakening for her, and it turns into that kind of a thing. <laughs> but now she's, if, if it, but if this is her last kiss, then she dies afterwards. So that's kind of like the divine punishment of it, right? Like she finally realizes oh. what she loved was the thing she hated the whole time. Like John was the, it's, you know, her stupid emotional mind, which we've already established. Every decision she makes is pure emotion without any thought going into it beforehand. Right. So it's like the first emotion she felt when seeing John was hate. And that fine line between love and hate is so thin that she really secretly loved John the whole time. And she wanted nothing more than to take his V card and his A card and everything else. Right. And she <laughs> yep. finally did it. And then dead. That's, that's, yep. a, that's like a very tragic character arc for her. But listen, Lady Stoneheart, I think, like you said, is the epitome of her character. It's like, yes. uh, if you, if you like brought it down to its most simple components and then just set it, it loose on the world. Yeah, exactly. You distill it. Chemically castrate it, but then you take <laughs> okay, what you cast. <laughs> no, you take the castration portion, like the substance, okay. the virility, and that's Lady Stoneheart. It's like lack of accountability and entitlement, like incarnate. She takes no responsibility for her own mistakes when she's alive at yep. all. And now she's reborn with the sole purpose of taking revenge on the select few people that made her take accountability for her actions. Right. That being like the phrase, anybody involved with the Red Wedding and the Lannisters. Like it just keeps on expanding outward and outward and outward too because she knows deep down the, the series of unfortunate events that is her life. <laughs> it, they all, it, it's, her, it's her fault. Everything's her fault and she knows it, but she's trying to project it and take it out on everybody else and because no matter how many people that actually surrounded these situations that she lived through die, it never satisfies her. She just needs to keep on branching outward and outward and outward and eventually she'll overtake the world. So I think I think it's the ultimate embodiment of what uh, George, my buddy George, was trying to say with her character. Oh, yeah, Big G. Uh, he definitely wanted to give us the last uh, hint, you know, the whatever you want to say, like the book over the head, like, you idiot. Don't you see she's an insufferable bitch this whole time? Do I have to, like, spell it out for you? Hey, thanks for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see more content like this and smash that like button. Or not. We don't care. <laughs>